Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Tom Christensen. I'm the director of the China and the World program here at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Um, I'm also the uh, interim dean at the school right now. Um, this program is the first program for my uh, for the China and the World program this uh, this semester, um, and it's a very special one. Um, and we're sharing this uh, hosting uh, re uh, responsibility with the Weatherhead East Asia Institute. Um, and uh, we thank Julie Kwan for her good work in putting this together. Uh, the China and the World program has hosted discussions about cross-strait relations and US-Taiwan relations in the past. And in recent years, we've had um, some very distinguished speakers from Taiwan. Um, one being the, uh, the director of the Taipei Economic Cultural Representative Office in Washington, B. Kim Xiao, who's a Columbia alum. Um, we've also had um, uh, Vice Foreign Minister Xu Sejian uh, uh, speak uh, to China and the world in recent years. Uh, both of those uh, distinguished speakers were from the, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party in Taiwan. And we thought it was a good idea to have a session in which uh, some of those topics were discussed by people from uh, the opposition party in Taiwan, uh, the KMT. Um, and we have a very distinguished panel today. Uh, and I thank uh, Andy Nathan for helping set this up. And I, I, I thank um, one of my former students, Will Thompson for helping set this up as well. And today we have speaking about these issues, cross-strait relations and US-Taiwan relations. We have Dr. Alexander Huang, who is the KMT Director of International Affairs. Um, he's also an Associate Professor of Strategic Studies at Tom Kong University. Um, I've known Alexander for uh, so long that if I said, we would both look old. Um, so I will not discuss how long I've known uh, Alexander. He's widely known in the United States as a leading expert on East Asian security affairs, on cross-strait relations and security affairs, and on US-Taiwan relations. We also have uh, today, Mr. Eric Huang. Mr. Eric Huang is the director of the KMT office in Washington. Um, this is a very important role that a lot of Americans don't know about, that uh, Taiwan has its representative office in Washington, but it also has representative offices for the major parties. And uh, Mr. Huang represents the KMT in Washington. That provides very good information to the Congress and to the executive branch about thinking in Taiwan and so that the United States government is much more knowledgeable about uh, trends in Taiwan. And we also are just uh, very honored to have uh, uh, Mr. Johnny Jiang here. And he is um, the former uh, uh, party chairman of the KMT. And unlike many of our guests, he is an elected official. Uh, he, is, he is a member of the uh, Taiwan parliament, a legislature from Taichung. And um, not many of our speakers have been elected and not many of our speakers could get elected. So congratulations to you. And um, it's, a, it's a great honor. So this is a topic of, um, uh, of great, uh, great importance to me and to our uh, initial commentator, who's my, my advisor uh, when I was in grad school at Columbia, Andrew Nathan, who's a class of 1919 uh, professor of political science here at Columbia. Um, and I learned a lot of this from, from, from Andy Nathan when I was a graduate student. Um, and then I studied this as a scholar and I became an official in Washington. And this was my area of responsibility. I was deputy assistant secretary of state for uh, China, Taiwan, and Mongolia in the East Asian and Pacific Affairs uh, Bureau of the State Department. And I wrestled with these issues of cross-strait relations and US policy towards cross-strait relations. And I tried to portray it in that fashion because it's a very complicated set of factors that are at work and it's of critical importance uh, to US policy in East Asia. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, allow the speakers to speak for a little while each and then Andy will make some comments after they've spoken and I will ask some questions as well. And then we'll open it up to questions. Um, please uh, don't use the chat function uh, if you're in the audience, please use the Q&A function to write out your questions and we'll address the questions after the panelists have spoken. And I'll do it in the order of my introduction. And I will first ask uh, Dr. Alexander Huang, uh, my old friend to, to speak first. 
And thank you, Tom. And uh, I greatly appreciate this opportunity uh, to speak at uh, your forum and uh, to uh, engage in uh, discussion with the wider audience. Um, and, and specifically, thank you for the opportunity uh, and big thanks to Andy Nathan uh, to provide this uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, given the interest of time, because I, you know, for professors, we, um, I used to say that we need to speak for three hours to get paid. But uh, today I'm given uh, the first 10 minutes to give you a highlight, and I'm pretty much looking forward to, you know, discussions. Let me say this, uh, the KMT's assessment of the current situation, of course, number one is the uh, great power competition. We see, um, you know, uh, potential crisis uh, over Ukraine. Uh, we see uh, that at least for three, four years that China uh, is uh, taking advantage of its rapid development and uh, started to move uh, more and more beyond its uh, borderlines. Um, and given this uh, trend, I believe that it is crucial uh, for uh, not only Taiwan, but the region to maintain that peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. The KMT's view is that uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, of course, uh, sided with a uh, democratic community. Uh, Taiwan is a full-fledged democracy. Taiwan has a long, long, long history uh, in terms of strategic and uh, cultural uh, uh, linkage with the United States. Uh, however, Taiwan also needs to mitigate threat uh, and um, prevent crisis for ourselves and for our neighbors. Uh, in the region, uh, which means that we need to be able to deal with potential problems. Uh, one of the problems that for the past four, six years is that we do not have any communication, government to government communication uh, with the mainland side. Um, you know, sometimes when there is a strong competition, there is a sharp difference between democracy and dictatorship uh, or a conflicting uh, values uh, across the Taiwan Strait, it is easy to think that uh, we will only take the confrontational side, uh, but forget about the cooperation side. Um, you know, we our relations with the mainland is not as complicated as the United States uh, and China. Uh, Secretary Lincoln said that um, that you have threefold relationship. Uh, you, you have competition, you have cooperation, and you have uh, adversarial relationship. Uh, in the past six years, we see that Taiwan is moving toward more and more confrontational approach vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis, uh, the mainland China without a uh, crisis prevention mechanism, without official communication. That's the area that we believe that is especially crucial for every one of us uh, in the next few years uh, that we see if we all agree that our shared interest is uh, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, we believe that we are a strong candidate to maintain uh, such peace and stability in the, in the next few years. As we all know that, um, you know, uh, Xi Jinping is getting into his third term from 2022 to 2027. And uh, 2027 is also uh, uh, the centennial of the People's Liberation Army. Uh, we are about three years away from uh, the 10th year mark of Xi Jinping's military reform. So for the next few years, it's going to be crucial for everyone, especially for Taiwan. Now, let me move on to the wider range of the region. Um, we all understand that uh, the uh, indo uh in Hawaii had promoted uh, and successfully uh, secured the first year uh, budget support from the Congress uh, on this uh, PDI or Pacific Deterrence Initiative. 
we understand that um, um, you know we may not agree with uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, in his assessment of uh, East is rising, West is declining. Um, but uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, I believe, or we believe in the KMT that we need to buy time, both in the United States and in Taiwan. For the United States, the, uh, the PDI uh, or the uh, modernization of the platforms, replacement of the obsolete systems, uh, introducing the new operational concept uh, and introduce uh, new uh, high technology into the future uh, warfare. Uh, the United States needs time uh, beyond build back better, beyond uh, we get our uh, you know, act together to strengthen uh, uh, and uh, for a healthier democracy. Uh, Taiwan also needs time from the la very last year of Obama administration through the Trump administration until uh, two days ago, all the arms sales, uh, uh, you know, items that have been approved by the Congress um, and needs time to get it done uh, and ship it to Taiwan. And, and we will need time to do uh, the reorganization of our uh, command structure uh, to the battalion level, we need to exercise, we need to train them. So, so Taiwan also needs time, even if we wanted to move to a asymmetric centered, you know, uh, uh, defense uh, operations. So, so for the next few years is more crucial than ever that we believe that uh, we need a certain communication uh, on the other side. The KMT will not talk about political uh, um, uh, resolution across the Taiwan Strait. The KMT will not talk about unification with Beijing. The KMT wanted to maintain the low bar is a crisis prevention telephone communication line. The high bar is to resume people-to-people uh, -people communication uh, and travel after uh, uh, a certain control of the pandemic. We believe that um, a stronger people-to-people -people exchange, uh, given the fact that China is our largest trading partner, we are, our, uh, our trade with China and Hong Kong consists uh, beyond 42% of our total trade. That's the reality. And uh, a government needs to have the channel uh, needs the ability um, to protect uh, our citizens around the world, especially investors on uh, mainland China. So, so more likely that uh, if we have a chance to return to power, we believe that we will be in a better position uh, to uh, promote um, uh, functional uh, issue-based people-to-people communication. And also we would like to resume uh, official dialogue uh, at the level at least uh, that when there is a potential crisis or a, a potential for unintended incident that we can have a communication line. Um, and um, we are part of uh, the Democrat uh, Democratic Alliance. Uh, we continue to forge our relationship with the United States. So uh, in conclusion, I would say the KMT's approach to our relationship with the United States and with the mainland is that we are not pro-US or pro-China. We understand that to be uh, a full-fledged democracy, we would be able to, we have to deal with both Washington and Beijing to protect our national interests. The approach and the strategy is clear that we will continue to raise our capacity and capability to defend democracy, to defend uh, militarily the Taiwan uh, and Penghu area. Uh, on the other hand, we try to uh, uh, reduce the threat and mitigate the crisis uh, or, or the, um, the uh, conflict. So we think we do both. Uh, we are in the better position
to provide another alternative choice for Taiwan Electric. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, and uh, I would like to turn to um, the next speaker on the schedule, who is uh, Mr. Eric Huang, but I'm not seeing his, his uh, picture any longer. I think he's having some difficulty with connectivity um, and we'll try to bring him back. Uh, so in the meantime, I will just skip to the third uh, scheduled speaker who is um, uh, Mr. Johnny Jiang. And uh, Mr. Jiang, if you don't mind, um, maybe you could go before uh, Mr. Huang and uh, he can speak after you. Okay. <clears throat> so which means I can get more five minutes. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, I mean, hello, everyone. I, I want to thank you, uh, Thomas um, and Andy and, and, and a lot of uh, people working on this, uh, this, uh, this today's project, uh, especially the China World Program and the Way Ahead East Asia Institute from the Columbia University. I'm very honored to speak at this webinar, uh, especially as the former KMT chairman and the current uh, Republic of China legislature. I believe this type of uh, exchange and conference uh, greatly contribute to Taipei-Washington relations, uh, allowing us to achieve greater mutual understanding and establish a stable foundation for the future context. To the point, uh, the main focus of my speech uh, following today, I will uh, resolve around, uh, revolve around resolving cross-strait dispute by uh, emphasize people to people connection, which uh, actually mentioned by Alexander um, uh, before. And I will try to conclude by investigating several ways to achieve the goal of maintaining cross trade peace and stability. Um, first of all, I think I have to argue that the stability of cross trade relationships affect not only the stability of the Asia Pacific region. This stability is uh, also a key link uh, in the strategic security of the entire world. And the US approach and attitudes from 1949 uh, will into the future have been and will be of the almost importance. And looking at the recent change in international system and uh, at the dynamics of Washington-Beijing relations, I would argue first, Washington-Beijing relationships are moving towards stability uh, after Biden's Xi Jinping video conference. That's November. And second, I will argue cross trade relations, relations are trending toward fluctuation. And um, why uh, Washington-Beijing are moving towards stability? I, I think, especially uh, uh, carefully watching the uh, Biden Xi Jinping conference last November, I conclude that the relations between the two superpowers will be uh, competitive, but both sides uh, will establish guidelines in order to prevent competition from descending into conflict. So from this perspective, I believe that under Biden administration, relations between Washington and Beijing will be led of a steadier uh, control competition. Uh, but for the cross-strait re relations, I think it's uh, trending toward fluctuation. Uh, despite uh, the US-China uh, relations is getting, I mean, um, steady. But the question of Taiwan remains a latent fuse that may potentially initiate conflict. Um, especially a lot of uh, US, I mean, Western think tanks media have uh, discussed these pot potentialities with the most productive being the uh, economic, economic, I mean, economist um, magazines neighboring the island of Taiwan as the most dangerous place on earth. Uh, in, order, in order to avert this uh, potential for conflict and preserve the present and steady relationship uh, between Taipei and Beijing has become critical. Uh, but this uh, critical relationship 
has been quite a shitty in the past few years, uh, especially a lot of arguments recently say that uh, uh, you know, approximately 2027 is the uh, very critical timing. Uh, some even argues, such as the US former uh, Indo-Pacific Naval Commander Davison. Uh, he also said that uh, 2027 would be around the time that the CCP would resort to military forces against Taiwan. Uh, furthermore, uh, the CCP has repeatedly recently used the, the, phrase, the phrase new age plan for the party to comprehensively resolve the Taiwan question. Uh, I think this phrase will likely appear in the program for the CCP's 20th National Congress and possibly guide Beijing's primary plan for action against Taiwan. With this in mind, I believe that cross three relations would trend toward fluctuation in the next few years. So which, uh, if left unchecked, will ultimately and inevitably destabilize Washington-Beijing relations. So how Taiwan with the, uh, the situation? I think basically in Taiwan right now, there are two pace in the face of cross three relations. One is uh, holding by DPP, the other is argued by the KMT. Uh, for the DPP, I would, I would say that um, if, we, if you guys look at uh, the last October, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen wrote an article in Foreign Affairs magazines uh, that she, you know, she said she isn't pr uh, pursuing Taiwan independence, doesn't wish for military conflict and hope for peace, stability and mutual coexistence with the CCP. Basically, I think this article layers very clearly that the DPP's national security strategy, that is playing the democracy versus authoritarian car and relying on the democratic world to rescue Taiwan. This is very, I mean, I'm a style of core thinking of differentiating systems and nations by layer forms of government. Uh, but fails to, uh, uh, to take into account geopolitical realities. So I believe that instead of relying on outside help for our survival, Taipei's role should be that of a responsible friend uh, to Washington with the responsibilities of reducing tension and helping both sides uh, to avert uh, crisis. So that's why I think uh, we need to talk about the value of the KMT position, which uh, actually some mentioned by the Alexander. Um, for, for, for the, the KMT, um, I, uh, if we, uh, but I mean, uh, the, we, we must also look at the domestic side or internal side of them, I mean, the men and Chinese. Um, I mean, the, the, the national security or the cross trade relations actually not just influenced by the international system and not just influenced by the uh, leader of the uh, different government, um, uh, not just by the leaders across the Taiwan Strait, but also influenced by the society as, across the the Taiwan Straits. So for the KMT, I think we must also try to eliminate the recent, I mean, discussion of invocation via military force and the hostility that a mainlander feels toward Taiwan. Uh, actually, the KMT had already accomplished this goal in the past. And I think we will uh, accomplish them again in the future and last alleviate cross trade tensions from a people to people levels. And left hand, on the other hand, the DPP seems incapable of doing so, so far, uh, whether because of ideological or other uh, hindrance. Um, and I, I think, uh, although the KMT seeks to alleviate tensions in the street, 
this does not signify uh, or even imply that we seek to defer to Beijing's authority just because we seek dialogue in order to work toward peace uh, does not make us pro-Beijing. Our priority remains the sovereignty and independence of the Republic of China. Uh, for example, we unequivocally oppose Beijing's so-called one country, two systems. The unfortunate reality remains that they are our neighbors, whether we like it or not. Uh, and we must learn to live with them, especially since we know that the entirely relying on other countries cannot solve the issue uh, across the Taiwan Strait. To sum up, the DPP approach approaches the cross strait uh, question only from the international level. The KMT considers this level too, but uh, we think also from the people to people level in order to achieve regional peace. So in conclusion, I try to provide some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, approach that which could be considered to, to resolving the cross strait disputes by emphasizing people, people to people connections. Um, un, under the circumstances, I support for resolving cross strait that dispute by emphasizing people to people connection. Therefore, I try to advocate a people's peace theory to replace democratic peace theory for Taiwan Strait. With this theory, um, we, we seek to utilize one of the most intrusing, intrinsic value or inherent value in Chinese thought, that is the people as priority. In Chinese, we call minben shi xiang. This is, you know, the um, Minban versus uh, Minzu. Uh, uh, we, we know uh, at this moment, it's very difficult uh, to transform the CCP or uh, communist political system in a very short time into the uh, Western democracy. But still, we uh, need to solve the cross strait dispute. Uh, so how to uh, lay they you know, lay out the basis for this kind of uh, uh, cooperation, uh, dialogues, or exchange. I think it's very important. So back to go back to the fundamental thought in in I mean uh, in in Chinese um, uh, wisdom. That is, I call the Minben Xiang, which put the people as priority. Uh, this people-to-people -people approach will provide a voice for safeguarding the security uh, assets, uh, livelihood, or, or other fundamental rights of Taiwan people who have uh, ventured onto mainland China uh, to make their living. This approach will promote uh, protection of fundamental rights of mainland Chinese students, mainland Chinese uh, spouses of Taiwanese. This approach will proudly display the human rights values we enjoy on Taiwan. By emphasizing people to people connections, we will support all peoples on both sides of the strait, thereby eliminating spiraling cross strait hostilities and transforming both sides' perception of cross strait relations. In other words, the goal is uh, to begin rebuilding cross strait peace by starting from our two currently separated societies. Taiwan's, uh, Taiwan is absolutely not the world's uh, powder care, nor is Taiwan a strategic burden. Taiwan should instead be the world's dog or peacemaker, an essay for peace. Approaching matters from the perspective of the people serves the interest of both Washington and Taipei by transforming Taipei into the responsible friend that we should and can be. Uh, this is the route, and I believe that the KMT should pursue. We should work towards turning Taipei into cornerstone for world peace. We should work towards even more stable, long-term working relationship between the two sides of the strait and between Taipei and Washington. We should become the trusted channels through which both Washington 
and Beijing seek to cool tensions when their relations run hot. Taipei should be the so-called guardrail uh, mentioned in the uh, Biden Xi Jinping conference, protecting Washington-Beijing competition from descending into conflict. In order to, so in order to set up this guardrail, I believe that the party-to-party -party political dialogue or party-to-party -party, um, di diplomacy will be a crucial mechanism or media of uh, communication. In the past, the KMT conducted dialogue with the CCP by means of KMT CCP forum. In the future, I believe that KMT will also be able to similarly establish forums for dialogue with the Democratic or Republican parties in the US. I also believe that by means of double bilateral or even trilateral for formal or informal talks, by means of getting political party leaders, members, uh, members of Congress and expert scholars together, we will be able to break through uh, uh, unproductive amities and hostilities. Although pre-existing structures and frameworks may seem inflexible, Individual people are flexible. Together, we can be even more flexible when dealing with Washington, Taipei, Beijing relationships. Together, we uh, we can plot the course toward Beijing. I mean, toward uh, lasting peace. Um, so basically, I think that's that's my conclusion, and uh, I, I try to provide some thoughts for you guys to discuss. I think I, I just end here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnny Jiang. Uh, really appreciate your comments um, and your introduction of a new concept. Um, and we have Mr. Eric Huang uh, with us uh, as our third speaker. Uh, he's having great difficulty with connectivity with his uh, with his uh, computer system where he is. So. He's going to try to speak to us without his video because video takes a lot of bandwidth. Although I think we just lost them all together. Um, and uh, if we can't get him on, I might turn to um, to Professor Nathan to maybe raise a couple of issues with our first two speakers. Uh, he's been, Mr. Eric Huang has been making heroic efforts to uh, stay connected to us. And I really do appreciate his efforts, um, but it seems like it's not working at, at present. So maybe I'll turn to, to Andy Nathan, Professor Andy Nathan, uh, to start a discussion with the speakers. And when Mr. Huang is able to come back, uh, we will have Mr. Huang, who again is the, uh, the, the KMT office director in Washington, DC. Yeah, so anyway. thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Tom. Yeah, we have a great audience, I see a good turnout. So it just shows that our uh, people here are very anxious to hear the KMT view. Um, what I, I'd like to ask one of you to just explain a little bit how your policy differs from that of the DPP, because Johnny, I heard you say, maybe you could uh, just correct me. I heard you say that the KMT stands for something like you said for the autonomy of the ROC. What was your exact phrase? I, I wanted to jot it down, but I lost it. Your position is for the for democracy in Taiwan and for the defense of the sovereignty of the ROC. Is that right? Yeah. Did I get yes, it? Yes. Okay. You, you say, yeah. All right. And, and you want people to people uh, practical talks with the mainland. Isn't that the same position as the DPP? How is your position different? Um, I think uh, the people to people, uh, uh, I mean, connection or people to people, uh, I mean, relationship uh, should be the very, fundamental thinkings for both sides of the government. Uh, but based on this thought, then what would be the, uh, the, the critical, I mean, the uh, concrete actions that the government uh, will take 
I, I think it's also very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so far, especially after the 2016, uh, when the DPP government took the office, I think the, uh, the feeling across the, uh, uh, the feeling of people across the town street, uh, I think it's getting chilly and uh, uh, cold. So uh, even a lot of uh, people from mainland China and, and Taiwan, they, they begin to, I mean, hurt each other. Um, so we see the so-called uh, uh, the spiraling, you know, spiraling uh, hatred yeah. across the street. Um, that, in some sense, also uh, will push the government of both sides to take uh, harsh actions against each other. And, and, and sometimes to uh, justify their position, not uh, establishing, establish the, the dialogues. Um, I think this is also not the US want to see. It. The US government always say they would like to see uh, both sides of Taiwan Straits starting dialogue and solve the Taiwan uh, question or cross the issue peacefully. So the people to people uh, relationship, the people to people connections, I think that is to kind of rebuild the, the trust uh, across the, the, the Taiwan Straits. But now, but then is how the government take the, the actions to encourage you or to, um, to really have the actions uh, make the dialogue happen. I think that depending on the, uh, the different parties position and, and different uh, governments that they will try to do or not, or how much they can do, uh, or how active, uh, I mean, how proactive they will try to make this happen. Th thank, mm -hmm. thank you, Mr. Jai. Andy, I, ha I have uh, Eric Huang back on. I can see his name. I can't see his face because of the bandwidth issue. Maybe we can try to have him give his comments and I'll turn it back over to you for another question. How about that, Andy? Okay, Mr. Huang, if you can hear us and you can unmute yourself, uh, maybe we can hear your comments even if we can't see your, uh, your image. <laughs> Not I'm, sure. I'm not sure whether, um, you know, Eric can uh, hear from you uh, either because we, we are in different locations. Uh, but let me chime in uh, briefly for uh, a few minutes to talk about KMT's reestablishment of our representative office in Washington, D.C. I think in, this is by its own uh, act uh, through... Um, uh, setting up an office <clears throat> uh, in the United States uh, is a goodwill and a, a, a firm intention uh, for us to, um, uh, to engage in uh, communication, conversation <clears throat> with the people in the policy realm. Uh, we wanted to uh, introduce our views better, and uh, we will have our permanent staff uh, uh, station uh, in Washington, D.C., and travel to different cities uh, throughout this year. And uh, uh, I'm sure that another function of the uh, our representative office in Washington, D.C., is to plan and host uh, the travel delegations. Um, it is uh, the current policy that in Starting from 2022, uh, we will have various uh, delegations led by the what we call the chairman's envoy uh, to visit the United States uh, based on topic issues. Um, there will be a delegation <clears throat> focused on um, uh, supply chain and uh, and uh, high technology. 
Uh, the second one will be focused on trade uh, and uh, economic uh, uh, development uh, in Taiwan and in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, a third one would be um, uh, on defense, um, actually uh, working with my uh, department. We have formed an ad hoc, uh, what we call DDG, uh, the Defense Dialogue Group, uh, um, working with my department. Um, um, the group is consists with six to eight uh, senior uh, policy uh, uh, you know, makers before uh, and also retired admirals and generals uh, that we are uh, ready to uh, re-engage uh, in the dialogue with Pentagon and with the defense policy community in the United States as well. Of course, uh, before all these, uh, we are uh, working very hard and plan uh, Chairman Eric Chu's uh, personal trip to the United States. Uh, we hope that the pandemic situation will be eased, uh, you know, after uh, six to eight weeks. And uh, we are uh, uh, gear up uh, in those plannings. And I hope to see you in person in the United States as well. Uh, I would give more time for the audience and for, for Andy and for Tom to get into a more interesting discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alexander. Thanks, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry that uh, Eric Huang is having so much difficulty, but I appreciate you saying that. I just add to what you say that I, I don't know, when I was in the US government, I always found it very useful to talk to the representatives of the party offices uh, of, uh, of our Taiwan friends. And uh, I see that in the Q&A, uh, uh, there's uh, Mike Fonte from the DPP has joined us today and, and I, I used to interact with him as well as with the KMT office directors and it's just very useful for Americans to hear different viewpoints and have as much knowledge of Taiwan as we can uh, as we uh, approach some of these real challenges. So I appreciate the efforts of, of Mr. Eric Huang and, and the way that you represented it, Alexander. Uh, you know, Andy, I think I've been looking at some of the Q&A questions and I wanted to ask one myself, if that's okay, um, based on a few of them, try to put them together and it'll take me a moment to put them together. And uh, some of it struck me before, um, the, the notion is that the current uh, uh, administration in, in Taipei is unable to have contacts, uh, constructive contacts with the mainland, with the PRC. Um, and it's certainly the case that there aren't contacts, but couldn't it be said that the real reason that there are no contacts is not uh, the Tsai administration, but the PRC itself, that the PRC refuses to speak with the Tsai administration. And the, the pretext for that refusal seems to be that uh, President Tsai has never accepted uh, the so-called 1992 consensus, this concept uh, that was pushed uh, in Taiwan by previous KMT governments um, and by one of my uh, teachers, uh, uh, Professor Su Chi, uh, who helped create this concept, um, that she doesn't accept this uh, concept. Um, and one of the reasons she doesn't accept this concept is she, like many scholars, uh, thinks that there never really was a 1992 consensus in the sense that um, both sides of the strait in their respective facts transmissions said that there was one China, um, but the Taiwan side said that it was one China respective interpretations, and the mainland just said it's one China. And I believe it was Bonnie Glazer and the question list, uh, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our friends and a speaker in our series more than once, uh, raised the question, if the mainland's unwilling to say respective interpretations, um, and as Mr. Uh, Johnny Jiang said, um, uh, the KMT is devoted to uh, preserving uh, the sovereignty of the Republic of China, isn't there a danger um, that you will be accepting uh, that Taiwan is part of the PRC if you do not get the mainland to say that the basis of any cross-strait contact would be one in which respective interpretations was honored? Um, in other words, you would have to, in, in essence, concede the entire political 
uh, difference across the strait before you could even talk? Uh, and would that be worth it? And I guess that's the question that I have is, it's related to the 92 consensus. It's related to the notion that the KMT wants to preserve the sovereignty of the Republic of China. And it's related to this notion that the PRC from all signs seems to have a very rigid and stubborn view of cross-strait relations, that there's one China, but they won't say that uh, Republic of China is a legitimate uh, um, a political entity within that one China. And President Xi in 2019 in January uh, made a very assertive speech saying that the only acceptable uh, outcome is unification and the only acceptable form of unification is one country, two systems, which both the KMT and the DPP seem to reject. So it gets back to the beginning of my question. Isn't this really all on Beijing? Is it really the fault of the Tsai administration that there isn't contact across the Taiwan Strait? And can you fix that problem without actually surrendering in a sense, as Andy Nathan said uh, earlier in the comments before we started, without surrendering to the mainland before you can actually have the contacts that, that Mr. Zhang laid out in his excellent talk? Yeah, Ma, let me uh, quickly respond to this. This, this is a uh, complicated, but, but uh, it's a long-term question, an old question uh, that we all know and we spend years and debating and discuss about this. Uh, let me uh, make a few points. Number one, um, uh, we need to ask ourselves that uh, do we want a uh, quick, uh, final uh, terminal terminal resolve of the cross trade political differences anytime soon. Are we pursuing that? Do we want to end the game sooner uh, than later? Uh, you know, the situation is quite different from uh, the time when President Ma ying was in power, when Hu Jintao was in power. We all know that there is a strategic competition between the United States and China. We all know that Xi Jinping is a different person and different leadership and different decision style. So um, Xi Jinping with or without 92 consensus, uh, we, might, we might say that he is pretty much committed that he will do it his way. And, and uh, if Taiwan, uh, if President Tsai agrees with the, the, that there was a so-called consensus with, uh, you know, how much trust, how, how many years that uh, would need to bring to a possible direct official dialogue, that's issue number one. And issue number two is that, you know, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the uh, Hong Kong dialogue in 1992. And uh, we all know that the reality was that there was no conclusion uh, when uh, both sides met in Hong Kong in uh, late October and early November 1992. Uh, but it was um, two weeks later uh, on November 16th that there was a um, uh, kind of uh, creative, uh, you know, agreement or, or understanding, I should say, uh, precisely, understanding that when both sides deal with the functional issues, uh, that one China, uh, the definition of one China uh, could not be mentioned, uh, uh, could not be, uh, you, you know, mentioned, or it could be expressed, uh, um, by words rather than uh, uh, in writing. Um, the, the, the issue now back is that whether uh, 92 consensus, whatever it called, the four Chinese characters lost its value to maintain, to stabilize the Taiwan Strait. If we say that, oh, we, uh, we, if we agreed upon a uh, Beijing defined 92 consensus, then that's surrendering. Um, you know, I, I don't think it, it's, a, it's a give up of our thought, sovereignty or a surrender uh, Taiwan into the People's Republic. Of course, Xi Jinping wanted to do that. 
he wants to end the game. But, but for Taiwan, we wanted to do everything to prevent from, uh, you know, Beijing to take that way. So for KMT, in short, we still consider uh, the, the four characters, the 92 consensus, it's a useful tool uh, to um, mitigate, uh, uh, to, to reduce the tension uh, without surrendering, uh, to re-engage, reopen people to people and official dialogue in terms of helping uh, uh, our, you know, investors and, and, and business community that are living and working there on one hand, and also um, uh, lower the tension across the Tyrone Strait, even uh, KMT returned to power, even uh, KMT uh, said the words 92 consensus. I believe that the PLA Air Force will continue to fly sorties in the area that's southwest to the Taiwan's ADIZ. We understand that perfectly. But, but KMT opposed officially, strongly opposed the idea of Taiwan independence. Ty the KMT will not do anything to do so-called decentization. Uh, the KMT will not antagonize Beijing uh, to its nerves that heighten the tension. The KMT will help uh, yeah, to, to, to uh, reverse uh, the heightened hostilities among the people. We believe that we, do, we will never ever accept a one-party dictatorship. We will never accept a Beijing-defined uh, one China. But we, we do not see the people on the mainland as our enemies. I think the KMT will do our effort to make sure uh, to help that to ease the tension, to make sure that the people on both sides will not see each other as arch enemy. I think it is especially important, as I said in my first presentation, that the time is critical. Both the United States and Taiwan needs a better status quo, a better peace and stability. And, and we both need that and we know that. So this is uh, our um, you know, message to our friends in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a long question because I, I combined about five questions from the Q&A slide. And I hope I, I did justice to those people who asked that question, but I thought it might be useful to combine them. I'm gonna let, let Andy uh, take over here and ask a question. And if Mr. Huang is able to uh, participate, Eric Huang, in the uh, conversation, um, that would be great. Uh, you'd have to unmute and let us know that you can, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Andy right now. Go ahead, Andy. <clears throat> let me follow up on what Alexander just said. So you said it's, it's no longer the time of Hu Jintao. It's now the time of Xi Jinping. And Johnny said Xi Jinping has announced that in the Xin Shichi, he wants to, you know, Chedi Jejue Taiwan Wenti. So, uh, and you're, uh, and what I hear you saying, Alexander, is you want to postpone the status quo. Xi Jinping wants to settle it quickly. You want to drag it out. You want to kick the can down the road. You seem to believe that if you display a friendly people-to-people -people face to the mainland, that the mainland brothers are not your enemies, this will uh, calm down Xi Jinping. It will soften his resolution to solve the Taiwan question in the near future. I just want to check, is that your strategy, that showing friendship will, as it were, reverse Xi Jinping back to the Hu Jintao era of patience? I believe that Xi Jinping will never be Hu Jintao. And the, and the economic and the military might uh, 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 are much stronger uh, in Xi Jinping's toolbox. And especially for his mindset, Xi Jinping probably um, 
have um, you know a, a self confidence that beyond our understanding. Um, my point is that we do not seek a, a final uh, resolution of the political differences uh, anytime soon. We want to maintain a better uh, and more stable status quo. Um, we believe that stop continue stop antagonizing China on the daily basis and continue to remind you know daily uh, uh, to the mainland people as well that Taiwan is walking away. I, I think you know Taiwan needs to be smart. We understand the threat. We understand that Xi Jinping is not going to change his mind. We do not want to change his mind. Um, well, but but we need to do our our ourselves a service to to lower the tension. Um, you know, because Taiwan's survival and and sustainable development requires a lot of efforts. It's not, it's not trying to verbally, you know, to present, you know, uh, our view, you know, KMT is the party, uh, the only party that had the experience to pound the table and argue against uh, our Beijing counterpart. You know, I can testify that before uh, the Ma Yingzhou uh, Xi Jinping summit, in Singapore, uh, we 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 argue against each other. We even threaten to walk away, and Ma Yingzhou threatened not to board the plane to fly to Singapore. We argue until the day uh, until two thirty a.m. Um, you know, on the day, you know, before Ma Yingzhou uh, took off uh, from Taipei. You know, KMT, uh, we are not the party that and trying to antagonize China or show our different view through keyboards and, and, and news release. We are the person, we are the people that we, 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 told, we told them that we disagree to their face. And I think that kind of uh, you know, engagement is required. You know, we, we need to keep the communication line open. Uh, this is not surrendering to China or agree uh, or the KMT assume that KM, uh, that Xi Jinping will be the king forever. You know, the Chinese history does not provide that evidence that a leader will uh, be immortal. Um, what we believe that Taiwan uh, staying in a democratic camp, uh, the survival of the Republic of China uh, uh, will be a, a not only a must for Taiwan people, um, but uh, a, an example uh, for the future political possibilities in China in the long run. So we do not seek a sudden or quick solution. You know, why do we need to end the game right now? Why do we need to buy Xi Jinping's formula now? We tried very hard to survive. We will, we will try to prevent the crisis, lower the, you know, the threat. And, uh, and I believe it is a, a policy that needs specifically for the next few years for Taiwan and for the United States and for our neighbors. We have a lot of great questions in the q and I, of course, I, want, I have more thoughts, but maybe we should go to those. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. I saw I saw one which is a, a little different from uh, some of the other questions, and it had to do with the role of country countries other than the United States. And uh, we, I haven't heard a lot from uh, the speakers so far about the role of the United States and what you would prefer the United States to do or not do. Uh, in its policy towards cross-strait relations and, and toward Taiwan. And this question touches upon the question of Japan because uh, the United States-Japan alliance uh, is a strong uh, bulwark for the U.S. presence in East Asia and the U.S. has been the biggest supporter of Taiwan's security uh, going back to 1949. Um, 
And Japan seems like it has become, at least in, 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 its, uh, in its statements, uh, a little bit more proactive uh, in its expressed concerns about cross-strait stability and peace and uh, more proactive in its support for Taiwan as a fellow democracy. Um, and of course the US-Japan alliance is an important part of any kind of US military response to any kind of conflict across the Taiwan Strait. So what do you view as, you know, what is the KMT position on the proper role of the US-Japan alliance and of Japan in Taiwan security? And if I could take the opportunity to tie on to this, because you, especially Alexander uh, Huang, and uh, are an expert on this. I mean, I just don't know any anybody who's a bigger expert on cross-strait military affairs and deterrence across the Taiwan Strait. And I know that uh, Mr. Johnny Jiang is on the on the, um, the the military committees in the legislature, so you must wrestle with this. You know, what, what is the role of the United States of this? What is the role of the US-Japan Alliance? And what is the role of Taiwan's future military planning in helping protect what, uh, what Mr. Johnny Zhang has said, protect the sovereignty of the Republic of China against incursions from the PRC? And do you have a criticism of tying one's, uh, uh, what's it called, overall defense concept? Um, Johnny, you want to go first, or 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 I I, I you know I, I can. <laughs> you know, um, that, okay. Um, from the outset, I I want to say that there there are uh, some critical messages that that we will bring to a closed door, not closed door with the U.S. government only, but closed door discussions with people like you. Um, um, and I uh, um, would not uh, you know, talk too much uh, in a open forum um, that, that we do have a plan. What, would, what I can share is that probably, uh, and I hope uh, that, um, that we will you know, uh, follow up with what we have done with Johnny uh, when, uh, when he was the chairman of the party. We continue the effort, and and uh, and I can uh, happily report to Johnny that that uh, that we hope by the end of this month we will have the KMT version of national security strategy guidance, uh, uh, you know, finalized, uh, and uh, and um, in in that uh, we uh, will be that will be a open. Uh, you know, a message. Uh, we will uh, make the both Chinese and English version, and then we will bring that to the United States. And to respond to the military issue, we do have our own view. Uh, we believe that uh, the United States uh, can do several things. Number one, uh, the United States can encourage the Japanese government to engage in quiet and more effective uh, and more courageous uh, move in terms of uh, conducting uh, meaningful uh, uh, dialogue on defense issues with Taiwan. I, I believe that Tokyo needs your encouragement more. Secondly, I think the United States can uh, open its heart uh, uh, for, at least for us, uh, to present uh, that our view uh, uh, for the uh, ODC or overall defense concept. Uh, we studied a lot. I personally, I, I wrote a, a, a uh, book chapter. Uh, it will be published by the United States National Defense University in the spring uh, um, on the overall defense concept. We support the the overall overall defense concept. Uh, we believe that we should go. Uh, uh, we should choose that approach, um, and uh, we believe that the United States uh, can uh, bring uh, more years to hear. You know what Taiwan's version of improving uh, 
the ODC, uh, how to make it more, uh, you know, uh, kind of implant into the current uh, Taiwan's operational uh, uh, apparatus uh, and, and command structures. Now, we believe that we should have a better but quiet and wider um, exchanges. Um, um, in the past, we, uh, we exchanged views by sending our delegation or our man to the United States. Um, we believe that uh, we should be able to, uh, through smart arrangement, uh, that, that we could see that the United States can bring its skill and, and, and the policy uh, uh, you know, interpretation to a wider Taiwan audience. Um, there are, you know, clear items. Uh, we list them already, uh, and uh, we will be very seriously, and uh, we will come to you and present to you. Um, uh, and finally, I want to say KMT supports the ODC. Uh, we have some uh, new ideas to how to improve it, how to uh, implement them in Taiwan collaboratively with the United States that within the acceptable and affordable budget uh, that Taiwan can offer. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are wide open for this kind of discussion. And uh, we can also work closer uh, to uh, exchange uh, our views and the intels on uh, our assessment of the uh, growing PLA capability. Uh, I, I myself had, you know, more than 50 students are continuing to watch the PLA on the daily basis. Um, and um, I believe if not because of the language barrier, you will find them valuable core of PLA researchers in Taiwan. And uh, we are willing to um, bring this, uh, the communities on both sides uh, together. And uh, I hope that one day you know, that, that either they improve their English speaking or mm -hmm. we will have more uh, Chinese speaking uh, American friends uh, and sitting together, I, I think we'll, that will be a a much better uh, you know uh, collaboration between United States and Taiwan. We we believe that you know on the defense part, we do have many many issues to talk about it. We support the uh, uh, reserve and mobilization reform uh, in a different way. And 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 a more workable way, more acceptable way, acceptable way by the Taiwan youth, um, you know. And and uh, and um, I testify in the LY. Uh, I I do not believe that the DPP is taking a right approach to do it. Any quick fix or uh, opening up and one more office would not address the real issue if we are talking about. Inst instant capability or imminent threat. So, so we buy time, uh, give us eight to 10 years. I guarantee you that our, our approach or formula can bring Taiwan a much, much better workable functional reserve and mobilization system. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, I you know, it's interesting because I've said on this, I've said on this, uh, in this program or in this channel uh, in the past that I, I was impressed that President Tsai really seemed to understand the military challenges that Taiwan faced and seemed to be adjusting strategy in a way that made sense given Taiwan's challenges from the mainland. And it's very interesting and, and gratifying to hear a member of the other party say the overall defense concept seems like a basically a good idea. And so there does seem, it's, it's unusual in Taiwan politics to have a consensus on almost anything. Um, so to have a, a sort of a consensus. Well, I, if I may chime in, uh, yeah. without you know really trying to antagonize all my friends in the DPP, um, if you if you come to Taiwan, I, I can tell you 
after Admiral Li Ximin left office, the MMD is not talking about ODC at all. Trust me. No, no, no. I understand there's a lot of po politics within the Taiwan government on this issue, but it seems like at the top, they understand it. At the top of the government, yes. they understand it. And it seems like you agree with the basic concept, which is which is encouraging because uh, personally, I think it's a smart concept. Yeah. And it's nice to yes. see consensus on anything in Taiwan politics across the parties. And this gets at one of the questions in the queue, and this is a real political science question. And it has to do with electoral politics, and we have an elected official here. Um, and it has to do with the nature of cross-strait relations in electoral politics in Taiwan. It's a very big topic in electoral politics in Taiwan. And I was, uh, just as back, backdrop for this, I was in Taiwan in January, 2019, and I was on the mainland just after it in January, 2019, when uh, President Xi made his speech on uh, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and the necessity, the prerequisite of progress on unification across the Taiwan Strait as a, a way of achieving that great rejuve rejuvenation and his statements about one country, two systems and the 92 consensus. And um, it was impressive because before that speech, President Tsai was not very popular in Taiwan. Uh, her popularity rating was uh, below 20%. Um, and that speech came out and it was very antagonizing to the Taiwan public. Uh, President Tsai's popularity rating went up by almost 20 points while we were there uh, in our entourage and continued to go up with the, with the, uh, the, the crackdown on pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. So my question is related to the 2024 election from a, a straightforward strategic point of view. You know, I'm, I'm not even a party member in the United States, let alone in Taiwan. So I'm not leaning in any direction, but if the mainland continues to pressure, pressure, pressure Taiwan, as you say, uh, Alexander, with, with the military exercises and this demand for one country, two systems, very rigid approach to Taiwan leading into the 2024 election, does the KMT have any kind of electoral hope of impressing on the Taiwan public that they have some kind of better approach to managing cross-strait relations that will not look like the KMT is too soft uh, in its dealings with Taiwan and therefore will not really have any hope in the cross-strait, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the election because if these old concepts of 1992 consensus and all the arguments that could be made about them are going to look very unpopular to the Taiwan public under those conditions. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a re related to a question that was asked in the Q&A. What, what, what do how do you see 2024 and how do you see cross-strait relations playing into the 2024 elections? And that's both for, uh, uh, for you, Alexander, and also for Mr. Jiang. And I don't know if if, if Mr. Huang, can, Eric Huang can, can chime in or not, but maybe we'll start with Mr. Jiang, uh, Johnny Jiang on this one because uh, Alexander answered the last one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think 2024 will be still a very challenging year for the KMT, uh, especially on the cross-strait issues and uh, made in China policy side. Um, uh, especially after the 2020, um, election and before that, that is the there, there was the uh, uh, speech by the Xi Jinping in 2019. Uh, you just mentioned, I think that that's the very critical uh, critical uh, point uh, that turning uh, KMT uh, cross trade policies into a kind of a, a challenge side or, or, or downside. Uh, so that's why in the past uh, two, two or three years, uh, especially um, a lot of KMT supporters, uh, even though we supporting uh, so-called 92 consensus or one China with uh, different uh, respective uh, interpretations. Um, but we know um, uh, the 92 consensus has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, destroyed uh, or uh, on purpose by the uh, our uh, political competitors or, 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 or other parties. Um, 
So how to make the uh, cross trade policy of the KMT um, much more acceptable to uh, uh, Taiwanese people? That would be the, the main job for the KMT uh, right now. I think the, the KMT headquarters is, is also doing this right now. Uh, so hopefully uh, by then, I think we may have the uh, you know, internal consensus uh, to persuade uh, the people of the Taiwan to accept that uh, our KMT's position or KMT's uh, made in China policies uh, would be overall better for, for Taiwan or overall better for the current cross trade relationship. Also uh, would be uh, also better for the Washington, Beijing and Taipei relationship. Uh, because uh, from the past until, until today, I mean, including the Washington, uh, I think we all know that uh, uh, the complicated uh, uh, triangle relationship among Beijing, Washington and Taipei. It's all about one China issue. Or oh, how can we solve one China issues uh, among these very complicated cross trade and triangle relationship. So from the Washington perspective, uh, you, you have the so-called uh, three communicates and TRA or, or uh, plus six insurance. Mm -hmm. to create uh, a strategic environment, uh, which actually uh, is, we all know, try to create a, a strategic ambiguity environment mm -hmm. for, for, for both Washington and Beijing. And for KMT, we, we know uh, the cross trade issues, you never escape from the one China issues. You had to deal with, you had to face these issues. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you have to face the military conflict uh, or uh, 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 military forces. So how to create the uh, strategic ambiguity across the Taiwan Strait? I think that's, been, have been done by the 92 consensus. Yeah. So uh, indeed, we are doing the same thing, that is to create a uh, so-called strategic ambiguities to deal with this, this very complicated uh, or lasting sovereignty uh, problems across the current streets. So right now for the KMT is how to persuade uh, Taiwanese people that the KMT will protect our sea sovereignty and we will protect Taiwan and we will protect our lifestyles in Taiwan that uh, especially for our younger generation that you know we like this kind of lifestyle. We will never sacrifice our lifestyle even though we support cross trade dialogue. We support cross trade exchange. We would like to uh, solve uh, the, the sovereignty issue across the strait peacefully, but we won't sacrifice, uh, you know, uh, our values, our democratic values, our lifestyle. So that's why I think we, we will not be, you know, so naive that, you know, uh, we don't need any military support or we don't need to increase our military capabilities. So a uh, sufficient military capability is a requirement for credible deterrence to protect our democracy, to protect our uh, lifestyle, to make, uh, you know, make us, make Taiwan have the, um, uh, the protection to talk with uh, men in China. I think we know this, uh, but we have to tell people why we do this. Yeah. Uh, you know, yes. because we don't we don't want to uh, have no choice but to go to war. Right. You know? I, so I think the from, the from the Washington perspective, we 
you, you are also trying to uh, make the cost uh relationship uh, resolve peacefully. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think a war, I think it's fair to say a war, a war would be disaster for everybody. Um, there's no question about that. And I think for the mainland as yeah. well. And that's something yeah. that needs to be yeah. Tom, Tom, I have a a, a short footnote to uh, Johnny's uh, remarks. <clears throat> we learn a a, a a devastating uh lesson, uh heart lesson uh back in January uh 2019 when Xi Jinping made that speech. That was, uh, uh, you know, the 40th anniversary of China's Taiwan policy. And uh, our next election in 2024 will be in January. Um, and, um, and the January 1st of 2024 would be the 45th anniversary of that, you know, Taiwan policy <laughs> remarks in 1979. So, so for KMT, um, you know, in the summer we are go I'm going to host a war game to simulate what if, no matter how hard we campaign, no matter how how hard uh, we try to work with our young generation voters, mm -hmm. you know, two weeks or ten days before our presidential election, if Xi Jinping decided to destroy KMT again. <laughs> by saying some nasty words, then it's going to be hard. So, yeah. so I am going to organize uh, a, a a simulation for that scenario, and and uh, so we can help our uh, KMT uh, politicians and, and 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 people in public office uh, to to uh, learn from the very beginning that what could be our better campaign strategy to prevent uh, the, the damage that Xi Jinping may decide to do in January 2024. It's a Jinbei, right? So, so it's, uh, it's, so it's, uh, so it's a fascinating uh, concept you have. If it's any comfort to, uh, to your analysis, there was no, there was no such speech on the 35th anniversary of the letter to the compatriots. So maybe 40 is different than 45, but the, the, uh, the, it's an interesting uh, concept that it may, it may happen again. There's something that's going around the United States uh, discussions of these topics, and it's in the Q&A uh, list, and I wanted to mention it to you. A lot of people are making connections between Russia's pressure on Ukraine and the mainland's pressure on Taiwan, and people have drawn all sorts of connections in their minds about how uh, an invasion of Ukraine might favor the mainland over Taiwan or might not favor the mainland over Taiwan. And I wanted to know what the KMT analysis of this situation is. If uh, President Putin uh, orders an attack on Ukraine, uh, is that a, a real danger for Taiwan's security? Uh, and how does it play out in the domestic politics of Taiwan? Does it <laughs> Does it, would that, that crisis situation uh, help the KMT or would it help the DPP uh, in domestic politics in Taiwan if there was uh, the unfortunate outcome of a, a war between Russia and Ukraine through a Russian invasion? I hope the, uh, the Ukraine uh, crisis or issue would be an issue of 2022 um, and not go beyond. Um, I believe there is a, a, a positive angle and, and a negative one. The, the negative one has been discussed uh, a lot uh, by journal articles and, and, and TV talk shows about the similarities or uh, if there is a conflict uh, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, the United States can no longer afford to a major regional conflict uh, and around the world, so Taiwan will be endangered. Uh, but um, through my per professional view, that 2022 is too important to Xi Jinping, and, and maintain stability at home is more important. Uh, maintain uh, economic stability uh, uh, and function is more important than uh, attacking Taiwan or use force against Taiwan at least 
uh, I, I think he won't do anything stupid before uh, the party Congress in the fall. Um, that's that's the, uh, the one side of the story. I, I think the other uh, positive, possible positive one is that for Taiwan people, not only DPP or KMT, but for Taiwan people to think twice that, that if we are in any way similar to a Ukraine citizen, Ukraine situation, you know, whether our fate will be determined by NATO versus Russia or uh, <clears throat> by the Ukrainian uh, uh, citizen themselves. I, I think there will be a positive note uh, for Taiwan citizens, for my students to think, and I will try to remind them that, that we need to have uh, a, a very vigilant uh, view on our own interest. And, and, and it is after all that Taiwan needs to survive and, and to sustain. So, so how to uh, protect our own national interest, how to do meaningful dialogue with powers, uh, how to survive, uh, how to protect our future generation and give them opportunity. I think this is the whole idea that we are working so hard I think Johnny, me, and many others, uh, we work for the future generation. We wanted to, before our retirement, uh, we wanted to do everything possible to provide a peaceful and stable uh, environment so they can continue to with their dreams and, and they can continue to think about their, their, their own future. So this is, uh, this is, you know, really from the bottom of our hearts that, that we do believe that in the next few years that Taiwan needs a better uh, leadership, a better functional, uh, you know, cabinet uh, to bring, to help Taiwan sailing through this troubled waters. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to let Mr. Eric Huang say something. I, I saw his hand go up, which means he actually has enough connectivity to speak. And I wanted to give him a chance to speak, even if we can't see him. Uh, I'm really sorry for the difficulties. And I really appreciate your efforts, uh, Mr. Huang, for uh, staying online and, 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 and being with us. Can you, can you speak to us now? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can so hear I you. Yes. I apologize, um, you know, one router later. So the hotel actually uh, came in to change the router. Um, I just want to very quickly um, answer to the Ukraine situation. I, I see there might be two impacts to um, the public in Taiwan. The first impact is, I, though I may be wrong here, but I don't think um, given, the ch given the situation of you know, Russia having a military um, action towards Ukraine. I don't think America will uh, respond militarily, uh, which means I don't think Americans will risk um, their soldiers going in to prevent this. However, I do believe that economic actions will be taken. Um, I think that economic sanctions will be taken. So there will be two impacts in this uh, to Taiwan. First impact will be that people will view the Americans' uh, failure um, to intervene militarily. Uh, the second impact will be, this is my belief though, I could be wrong. I think Xi Jinping will be happy to play ball with the Americans. And um, well, in this case, not, not play ball with the Americans, meaning they will not go along with economic sanctions on Americans towards Russians. So this will definitely have an impact on Taiwan's economy, especially with China. So th these are two, um, two potential implications in the situation. Of course, um, you know, we, we as um, peace lovers, we, we hope that everybody can maintain peace and stability. Um, and we, we wish that, um, you know, the situation will be under the wrap here. Um, but to, an to, to answer your question directly, a very short form, I think, um, if there is a, I think the situation across straight uh, might even 
So as a result, the party who can represent itself better manage the situation will win the voters' uh, hearts and minds. Thank you, Mr. I'll just say something my own opinion on, on this issue is that a lot of people in the United States seem to think that Xi Jinping has a big, uh, in, uh, uh, would, would gain uh, tremendously if Russia invaded Ukraine and that it would help his ability to pressure Taiwan. Um, I don't think it's that simple for the following reason uh, as a China specialist. I, I think a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine would in a sense be a disaster uh, uh, for Xi Jinping in that I think the result would be, as you said, Eric, uh, that uh, the United States and the Europeans would level very heavy sanctions on Russia. I think that China would try to backfill some of that uh, economic pain with some assist, you know, some extra economic cooperation with Russia. This would make uh, look like an authoritarian bloc of Russia and China against the free world, which would lead to a greater division of international politics along those divides, along authoritarian and democratic divides. Um, I think it would lead to more technological sanctions or limits or restrictions on trade with China because it would look like an uh, authoritarian bloc that needed to be countered because it was an aggressive authoritarian bloc. And I think it would be an embarrassment to the Biden administration, which I think would double down on its, uh, on its position in Asia saying, we, we can't afford to give in to any kind of authoritarian expansion in the future. Um, so it would make, a, uh, if anything, a more resolute position on uh, support for Taiwan's defense uh, in, in Washington, uh, which is not in Xi Jinping's interest either. Uh, so I don't, I don't see a lot of advantages for the PRC in Russian aggression. And I can't help but think that I thought of all of those outcomes and that Chinese strategists on the mainland haven't also thought of those outcomes as the likely result of a Russian aggression. So I don't expect Beijing to try to criticize Putin or criticize what he's doing, but my guess is that they hope he doesn't actually carry out an invasion because it will run against uh, uh, the interests of uh, the PRC and dealing with both uh, cross-strait relations and also with the United States, uh, which is probably even more important to Beijing. But that's just my own my own opinion of the situation. But you see a lot of journalistic uh, analogies between Ukraine and Taiwan and this idea that you know anything that's bad for anything that the United States likes is good for the PRC and therefore this would be good for the PRC. But I, I think the, the reality is more complicated than that. Um, so th th that, that, that's my own view. I, I, we're, it is 8.35. Andy, do you have any uh, comments or questions to raise before we, before we wind up? We have gone 90 minutes and you can always tell it's a good meeting when, boy, you know, the time is gone and you wish there was a lot more. Um, and I really appreciate everything that's been said so far. Andy, I'll let, let you say something now. Well, Alexander said that Chairman uh, Drew is coming to visit the United States and you're coming with him. So we welcome you and him and Eric will be back in the US by that time. So we hope we'll see the three of you, maybe Johnny will be, I don't know who else in your delegation yeah. to come in person, maybe by that time the COVID will maybe be lightened up. Look yeah. forward to seeing you in person. Yeah, and you can come to the real capital of the United States, which is New York City. And uh, <laughs> you can visit us, visit us at Columbia University. Um, and we would love to have That's you good. all. We could have a forum, and you could uh, you could uh, you could make your points here. Well, we really appreciate. It. I'm really glad uh, that uh, Andy and and Will Thompson, my former student, uh, sort of pushed us in this direction of doing this kind of event. Um, and I think it's been very constructive. And I apologize to the, there was 27 questions, which is another sign of a very good event when uh, you get so many good questions that you can't possibly answer them all. Really appreciate your time. I appreciate um, the fact that you're very busy. Uh, J Mr. Johnny Jiang is an elected official and he's on these committees and, uh, and, and Alexander Huang, a very busy guy, a great strategist, um, an old friend. And uh, Mr. Huang, uh, Eric Huang, you get the special prize tonight for your struggles uh, to stay connected to us. And I appreciate it. Please don't apologize for it. It's technology, not effort. And we really appreciate you being here and making all those efforts to stay connected to us. 
Uh, thanks to the audience. This is our first event for the spring semester. I think I said fall before the spring semester, um, and we'll have <laughs> several other events. Uh, please join us, including the, the speakers today. You're always welcome to join China in the World events. Uh, we have speakers talking about topics in which you'd be interested, and uh, we look forward to a good semester. Thanks to all. Uh, good Bye. morning in Good morning in Taipei. Good night in, uh, in New York City. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks. See bye you. Bye-bye.